Yeah, welcome to a special edition of The World This Week. The World This Week, seven days, four Paris-based correspondents, one hour. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Foreign editor Christopher Dickey is with us, as is Stav Alfon, correspondent large for Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to freelance uh, Venezuelan reporter and photojournalist Sarai Suarez. Hello. And uh, France 24's Emma James is uh, burning the midnight oil for our media watch <laughs> segment. She's furiously uh, tr uh, trawling. Absolutely. Uh, not trolling, but trawling. Yes, no uh, trolling. There's a lot of And a there's lot a lot of, of activity, through. of course, uh, uh, so. on, this, uh, on this. We'll be uh, checking in with you uh, regularly throughout the show. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag World This Week. This time it has indeed come to a head. The resolution of the declaration by Parliament's representatives has been approved by 70 votes in favour, 10 votes against and two abstentions. Celebrations and applause break out in Catalonia's parliament. As it finds All right, uh, the, the, uh, we'll, we'll hear more perhaps uh, of that report later on. Uh, the, uh, the Catalan anthem was sung outside the regional parliament after separatist lawmakers uh, voted for independence. And even though 38 minutes later, over in Madrid, the Senate uh, ratified direct rule over Barcelona, uh, the chanting and celebrating continued Spain's worst political crisis in four decades, again, coming to a head this Friday. All right, uh, uh, Christopher Dickey, uh, the uh, uh, parallel universes there. Uh, in, <laughs> Good way to describe it. In, in, in Madrid and Barcelona, celebrations going on as the Spanish prosecutor talks of rebellion charges. Yeah, well, this is a historic moment that actually is part of a long and it's becoming a fairly tedious process of what they call in Spain conflicting legalities. Parallel universes may be a more colorful way to say it, where Spain is looking at the constitutional, Madrid is looking at a constitutional legality, uh, and Catalonia is kind of making up its own legality as it goes along based on ideas of self-determination and Catalan national identity. And it's hard to see how those two get together. What is fairly predictable is that the Catalans particularly need a martyr of some sort. Now, if Puigdemont, Carlos Puigdemont, the president of Catalonia, if he's arrested, maybe he'll be that martyr in jail, biding his time, the Nelson Mandela of Catalan independence. Uh, but it's even more likely that there will be violent incidents if Spain tries to impose its rule on Catalonia the way it tried to impose its authority during the election process uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and when I think it's fair to say a handful of images of people getting beaten up, of one old woman with blood coming down her face, and a few people falling downstairs did more to mobilize opinion in favor of Catalonia than a thousand debates and referendums could have done. Yeah, and again, the uh, two leaders uh, on this uh, Friday day of reckoning uh, talking at cross purposes, the one in Barcelona, the other in Madrid. Hmm. All right, we'll, uh, we'll maybe hear from, uh, from uh, uh, Car Carlos Puigdemont and Mariano Rajoy uh, later on. Uh, Sarai Suarez, the uh, uh, Catalan leader uh, who there was on Thursday this thought that maybe there was going to be this call for snap elections that could preempt uh, the uh, announcement of direct rule out of Madrid, and then it never happened. Well, he knows he he has the 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 support of a part of the population, but he knows also he he doesn't have really a strong uh, position because he he has a, a big number, but not all the, the 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 seats that he would need to really be a majority. And the the polarization in this in this uh, in this case is really something that is going to ha to to do a lot of of. Um, is going to hurt a lot the society of, of uh, Catalonia, and that's something that we see in other places where where the situation is get to a point of non-negotiation where nobody's listening to any is listening to anybody. And uh, now I know that's what I've I've been listening with my friends and the people I've been talking to in Catalonia is that 
people are not talking anymore. They're just the subject, the political subject. Subject is really a way. A, a, a fighting it is a fight every time we talk about politics. Uh, there is people closing Facebook friends and putting away uh, friends from WhatsApp. It's really at this point where the tolerate, um, toleration to, to talk about the subject is non-negotiable. Th those who are uh, on favor of the, of the independence are not going to move from that position and the people who want to stay in a constitutional way are not moving from that position too. So this polarization is going to get bigger and bigger. And as you were saying, the the possibilities of violence, I think, in the in the coming days, are really are really big. So the Catalans, we've said it a lot, are they're not violent. They we, they don't have a history of of violent protest. But as you're describing this v v polarization, which has reached a frenzied pitch, how do you explain it? Well, is a subject that really matters for them, and I think the the history of this of this region with uh, the past they have is now coming back. The 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 experience with Franco, all the story they the, the, that is behind this, is really coming back to to the feelings of these people. So um, they're not violent and they're really peaceful people, but. In a certain point, when you have someone walking on you, you you react and you wake up. So these little details show the the actions and the and the conflictuation on the way they're communicating right now on the subject shows that well there is a there is a, a potential uh, danger about about getting violent and defend themselves of uh, of the control that Madrid is trying to impose them. This polarization, of course, playing out on on social media. Very much so. And the interesting thing is that you talk about people unfriending one another because even within families, and it sounds exactly the same as what happened in the United Kingdom when we had Brexit, um, the polarisation of opinions seemed to cut across whatever other links and things in common that people had. And it still goes on in the UK today. And what's interesting to see is that um, in the United Kingdom in particular, they are going to be watching what happens with Catalonia because, of course, there is always talk about what could happen with Scotland in particular. They've already had an independence referendum. What is interesting to note is that the leader of Plaid Cymru, which is uh, the Welsh party, um, Leanne Wood, has said that Wales must recognise Catalonia, which makes you wonder, is Wales going to be heading for some kind of independence bid? Uh, in the national in Scotland, unsurprisingly, they are also calling for Catalonia to be recognised. Um, and I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, certainly, Nicola Sturgeon, the leader in Scotland, has been tweeting today uh, other comments from other people. She's not actually said anything herself, but she's quoted somebody else's statement saying that you know th this needs to be listened to and the will of the people needs to be listened to. Um, and there are quite a few articles uh, around, um, such as this on the, the Guardian website, saying that this is beyond Catalonia. Um, they're talking about all the pro-independence movements that exist within Europe, um, saying that really this could redraw the map of Europe. Uh, and it's very interesting. There are a lot of countries involved, and it's, it's quite a good one to take a look at if you're not too sure about these details. It gives you details of, of exactly how influential these areas are within the countries that they are part of. Yeah, because some of these are regionalist movements and some are separatist movements. It's not always the same. They, they, Absolutely. They some of them, various shades. Some of them are very different, but it is interesting how people are grasping, really, for similarities that they can apply to their own situation. Uh, Simon Jenkins has written in The Guardian as well uh, an article where he talks about how it is, uh, basically for Catalonia, legally, they have no leg to stand on. But it is pointless for Madrid simply to read the rule book and the Riot Act to solve the crisis, which is a great turn of phrase. Um, but what he says is that the Catalonians are really a vanguard of a movement in Europe uh, against the clumsy bureaucratic elites that rule Brussels as they do Madrid, not to mention London. Yeah, Dove Alphon, uh, several points in there. First of all, that everyone's projecting. Uh, and secondly, the big question at this point in time, when we look at independence declaration, direct rule, yeah. has it all gone too far? Well, it's a, it's a full-blown crisis. It's, it's never a good sign when the world, entire world suddenly know the number of an obscure constitution uh, you know, Alina. Oh, yes, Article 155. Article yeah. 155, yes, of course. Oh, of course this yeah. is never a good sign. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, we are in a full blown crisis. And uh, look upon the velocity by which all the EU leaders suddenly said we are behind Spain. There's no talk of uh, let's get those two together, we are going to be the go between. No, Macron already. Is, 
tonight again, and, and of course, uh, the UK and Germany, all the EU countries have a Catalonia problem of their own. Uh, and nobody needs a full-blown crisis in Spain. Do they all have a Catalonia problem of their well, own? Well, no, not this kind of, but yeah, North Italy, for example, uh, is really a big problem. And of course, Brittany may look folkloristic to you, <laughs> but if you are in the middle of a terrorist act there, it's, uh, it's certainly, yes, it could be severe. Well, I mean, I think the ones that count in terms of similarity are the ones where you have rich sections of, this, of a country trying to jettison the poor sections. Mm -hmm. That's what you've got with Catalonia, that's what you have mm -hmm. with Lombardia in, in Italy, uh, and that is really the problem. In Catalonia, you have added to that the whole kind of our culture is different and we were occupied by Franco and all the things that they recite endlessly, even though they've never really been an independent country. The, um, is, it, is it too simplistic, though? Because uh, we heard our Brussels correspondent said many, many in the halls of the European Union are saying after the vote in Lombardia and Venetia, these were non-binding votes last weekend, mm. uh, that there's this sort of move afoot where the rich don't want to pay for the poor in, in, in nations. No, but that's what I'm saying. That's, that's the kind of separatism that is, seems to be dominant at the moment, which is ironic because the idea of self-determination was really built around the notion that real oppressed people had the, mm -hmm. the uh, ability uh, and the political wherewithal and should have the political wherewithal to rise up and throw off oppression. Well, the oppression in Catalonia is they don't want to pay taxes for Andalusia. <laughs> That's the oppression in Catalonia. And one of the things, I think, to the extent that Madrid will take measures that will screw the independence movement, they'll mainly be economic measures because ultimately, while there's a lot of flag waving now, it was an economic debate that started this issue. It's a question of whether Catalonia would pay taxes, would, would lose its tax revenues to the rest of Spain. That was the driving issue. Of course, that's not the way separatists tell it to us. They talk about 1714. They talk yeah, about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's poetry and anthems and all that stuff. They should tell you about the flag, which is modeled on the Cuban flag. They should also tell you that the fortunes of Catalonia in the 19th century were made in Cuba on the backs of slaves. They don't mention that. All right. Again, uh, different messages, whether you're in Barcelona or in Madrid. The words that I'm about to say come from the heart. I'm very moved. This moment is historic. Today in Parliament, the legitimate Parliament of our country, a Parliament created following the elections on the 27th of September, this Parliament has taken a decision that many people have been waiting for. And the majority of legitimate lawmakers gave me a mandate to do this, which was validated at the ballot box. I would like to say that with this mandate, which the Senate gave to the government, we will take necessary steps to return to legality. I would like to say to all the Spaniards, to all the Catalans, that they should stay calm. Everything will happen efficiently, as it has been going on so far. Spain is a great country, a great nation, and we will not allow a few people to undermine the Constitution. Okay, so there's a lot of resentment, by the way, uh, Sara Suarez, against both of those men. Carlos Puigdemont for taking a domestic argument inside of the region and making it into this, uh, bringing the, the, the fight for independence to a head. And uh, against Mariano Rajoy for having too heavy a hand in, uh, in trying to stop the, the movement towards independence. Well, I believe it, if Madrid have dealt this crisis in another way, if they have allowed the referendum, they, the, the, the statistics show that they didn't have the majority to, uh, to approve the referendum. I think things would have happened in another way and, and Rajoy would be able to say, you see, I was right. But in, in, in the op he decided all the road. He decided to show, I am the strong man here and you're going to obey what I'm saying. So all these images, as you were saying, they, they just made a favor to the, to the independentistas uh, to, to really, the to, to, to really uh, gain the support of the people. And now what I, what I think could happen if there is more violence, 
also more people are going to be supporting the the independence of of Catalonia. The other thing also is that in Madrid, for example, in, and in Spain, you can see the that it has wake up uh, nationalism, um, uh, a, a strong feeling of we are Spain. And, uh, and that's also interesting to see because it's something that is getting stronger and, uh, and also it makes more bigger. It, Did you see this coming It makes in bigger the gap between the two places. Did you see this coming? Well, this is difficult to see it coming, but um, in a certain way, the way uh, that, that the Catalonia was, was pushing so hard to get, to get what they wanted um, was, was more or less, uh, you, you knew that Madrid was going to answer in a way. But I was not expecting uh, such a violence actions as they did for the referendum. I, I think an easy way to understand this may be with an American football metaphor. We basically have two weak teams here. The Catalan government is weak and the Madrid government is weak. And they're lined up against each other and they're trying to do what's called pulling the other one off sides. You're trying to make a move so that the other one will rush, break the rules, and then all of a sudden be driven back several yards. I think that's exactly what they're doing. During the, during the vote uh, a few weeks ago, it was definitely uh, Madrid that was pulled off sides with those terrible images of uh, abuse uh, uh, by the police. We'll see what happens now. Uh, the, uh, again, this is going to play out now for a long, long time. And we have, at the same time, the uh, region uh, which doesn't have a plan uh, it, it, with, with, with regards to what you said about the EU shutting them out. Do they have a currency if they really are independent? Do they have a, they're no longer members of the EU, clearly, if they, if they decide to go their own way? And as we were saying, Madrid, if to, to borrow Christopher's analogy, will certainly be pulled off sides if it uses force. Yeah, uh, I think nobody was prepared to, to the escalade. And uh, you could see that uh, really those nationalistic uh, wins in, in Madrid only reinforce the anti-Frankist talks in Catalonia. Mm. Oh, these guys brought us Franco, and now they are Very back. Civil, I mean. Yes, they are back. This is very dangerous. It's not, you know, you can uh, you can publish indeed poems and anthems, like you are saying, but it, it could lead to, to a lot of violence, and uh, people could die about that. And uh, you're looking, OK, who's the adult here? Who's the guy who's going to make those to talk? And you don't see anything like that? Right, we'll, have, we'll have more on this when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching The World This Week. Revisited. Presented by Stuart Norval. <laughs> In 1941, Hitler decides to invade Russia. In Leningrad, the resistance opposes the German army. The siege lasts 900 days. <laughs> Nearly 80 years later, the city has recovered its historic name of St. Petersburg. And on its outskirts, volunteers still search to find unburied soldiers. Today, this dark page in history has not been forgotten. Survivors tell their stories, and young children still learn about the siege of Leningrad. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com. Welcome back. You're watching France 24. Before we resume the world this week, some of the stories that Delano D'Souza is following for you in the newsroom. And one headline dominating all at this hour, Day of Reckoning in Spain. Catalonia's parliament votes for independence. The Senate in Madrid ratifies direct rule. The Spanish cabinet convenes as the state prosecutor's office prepares rebellion charges against uh, uh, the uh, top separatist lawmakers there.
Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Foreign editor Christopher Dickey is with us. Welcome back uh, as well to Dov Alphon, correspondent at large for Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz. Uh, Venezuelan freelance reporter and photojournalist Sarai Suarez. And uh, France 24's Emma James is with us. Uh, Sarah Suarez uh, is telling us before the break, and it's clearly obvious, the split, yes, it's between, when we're talking about the Catalonia crisis, between Madrid and Barcelona, and it's also between the Catalans themselves. Not even Kafka's trial was as Kafka-esque as the process being led by Mr. Puigdemont. How much longer are Catalans going to stand this? The Spanish state wants to impose its constitution and the unity of Spain with blood and fear. In response to the aggression, which is the application of Article 155, we continue to follow the mandate given by the people of Catalonia in the October 1st referendum. What we understand is that the majority of Catalans did not want either a declaration of independence nor Article 155, and it seems that everything is on the way to a disaster. Emma James, that's the, the leader, uh, the, a senator from the far left uh, uh, Podemos party. Uh, we're on the road to disaster, he says. Yes, and there are quite a few people um, reflecting that view when we look around online. Um, one of the most interesting things that I've seen actually comes from the mayor of Barcelona. Um, and she is left wing. She campaigned for Podemos in the last election. Um, she's actually been referred to in the past as the most badass mayor in the world by BuzzFeed, no less. Um, and she has published a statement on Facebook and she shared it on Twitter today um, where she says that she is neither for the Declaration of Independence nor for the use of Article 155. Now, what she says is that what's happened today is basically a train crash. Um, there is a, a hashtag that some people have picked up on as well. It's not as widely used as some of the others that we've seen. Um, but in this statement, she criticises Mariano Rajoy and the Spanish government for applauding their own failure, in effect. The scenes today in the Spanish Parliament as they applauded this decision. Um, she said they've been unable to propose any solution, unable to listen and unable to govern for all. Um, but what she does say as well is that independence doesn't have the support of the majority of people in Catalonia. Now that reaction is important of Alfon because uh, her party and the Podemos party, they're born of that indignados movement that happened uh, when there was the huge financial and housing crisis in Spain. Instead now, why isn't it still about the economics of it all? Why has it turned into an argument about nationalism? It was so strange suddenly to hear the voice of reason, you know, because it began with money, of course. But as Christopher said, this was the main thing from the very beginning. But on money, on, if, if you really want it for financial reasons, you can always build up with history, false or true. You can always build up uh, about independence and separation. And, and this is very quickly uh, advancing. And uh, there's an Israeli book by Edgar Keret called Missing Henry Kissinger about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. <laughs> and you can see how suddenly, even in, in this small crisis, wow, you were really missing somebody who could come and force a solution. There's also a kind of a rural cosmopolitan divide here. I mean, uh, Winchelman comes from basically from rural Catalonia, uh, up there in the hills, as it were. And that's where you have this real hardened Catalan nationalism. Mm -hmm. Barcelona is a cosmopolitan city. There are people from all over. There are a lot of people who came from other parts of Spain, from other countries, and the people of Barcelona tend to be much, much more open to the rest of the world and to the rest of Spain. But you have this big hinterland, and that's really what Puigdemont represents, that is driving this train. Well, one of the most interesting things is that you would think that the mayor of Barcelona on a day like today uh, would be, her statement would be shared incredibly widely. But despite the fact that she's got more than 750,000 followers on Twitter, um, that statement has only been shared and liked less than a thousand times so far. And it's been up a few hours now. Um, interestingly, though, well, with all the... it's kind of noncommittal, I mean. You know. Well, <laughs> yes. But it, it shows that, that people perhaps aren't buying into that argument at this moment in time. And maybe well, it is... Well, does it just show that social media is... is 
is for people with uh, strident views and that well, if, you, exactly. if you try to say I'm the voice of reason that yeah. it doesn't work as well. And this has already become so polarised. What is interesting to note as well is that Carlos Puigdemont on what is undoubtedly the biggest day of his political career um, hasn't been very active on Twitter at all. You might say he's far too busy for that kind of nonsense. However, one person he has <laughs> responded to is Donald Tusk, uh, the president of the European uh, Commission and what uh, so Euro European Council, sorry, and what he um, said on Twitter that prompted Carles to take to his keyboard was, for the EU, nothing changes. Spain remains our only uh, interlocutor. That's an unusual word in English. Um, I hope the Spanish government favours force of argument, not argument of force. Uh, now, of course, he has got straight back uh, to respond to that, saying, as you know, Catalans always favour the force of arguments. And the hashtag dialogue is there. But is there really any likelihood or any appetite for dialogue right now in the in Catalan? This is not going to resolve itself anytime soon, but I was watching France 24's coverage of this for the last few hours, which has been great. But one of the people you had on was a woman who's a lawyer, very pro-independence. And, and it was so, so typical of this whole debate. She says, well, you know, they say that if we are independent, we won't be part of the European Union. But you see, that doesn't really take effect unless Spain recognizes our independence. So we could declare our independence and still be part of Spain and still be part of the European Union. Mava. I mean, really. No wonder people get fed up with this story. People get fed up. People get confused. Yeah, there was uh, uh, a uh, Carlos Puigdemont uh, who previously had not not declared independence. Uh, <laughs> what was the what's been the reaction in Latin America to all of this? Well, I think there is a, there is a certain miroir in, in this situation. Mirror effect. Uh, mirror effect on the polarization that I was mentioning before in Venezuela is the case with all this uh, uh, division that we have between Chavistas, not Chavistas. And here is the same. It's, it's, a, non, it's, it's, a, it's a close road. Um, but I wanted to mention something that also is important and is going on here. As you say, Rajoy was a very, ha, have had a very weak government. And uh, and this situation, in the same in the same way that the violence that we saw during the referendum gave uh, the support of the pe of certain people to Puigdemont, uh, now a lot of uh, people from Spain are giving the support to Rajoy, something that they never thought they were going <laughs> to do because they don't like him very much. And oh, and now party, yeah. and now they feel that the guy is dealing the situation. And yes, you have to be strong and you have to go and, and tell them how things should happen. So so this is this is giving support to both parts in ways that nobody could imagine before. And that's something really interesting. So let's see where it gets them because and also dangerous. it's very dangerous yeah. and they're, and they're going to get something from this situation, both parts. So it's, it's, it's really special what's going on here. We had reports that there was the Basque president who tried to mediate on Thursday. Uh, I, I, earlier oh. you talked about uh, where's the Henry Kissinger. Who's the Henry Kissinger in this instance? Yes, I, I don't see any. Uh, with all due respect to the Basque president, <laughs> I think it's a real crisis and, and I think it's a time uh, really for EU leaders to step up and not simply say we support Spain and they don't. It's, it's, a, fin a final word on this, Emma? Uh, well, as for Carlos Puigdemont, he's certainly become the, the whipping boy, if you like, of uh, those who favour Catalonia remaining part of Spain. Um, this particular cartoonist, uh, Miki y Duarte, uh, has done a whole string of cartoons, well worth a look. Uh, this particular one says that uh, the important thing is not to look down, and it's got Carlos Puigdemont uh, leading everybody off the edge of a cliff. Uh, another one from this same artist has uh, Mr. Puigdemont saying, uh, welcome to the Republic, uh, independent republic of my house. And outside you've got Mariano Rajoy bricking up the doorway. It's um, a lot like droopy Rajoy. He does a little bit there, <laughs> yes. A rather unfortunate <laughs> big red nose. But... Uh -huh. um, El País, as well, is very, very much the, the mouthpiece of the Spanish government when it comes to uh, the independence or otherwise of Catalonia. Um, and they have some very interesting articles on their English website. If your Spanish isn't up to scratch, it's well worth a look. Um, this one in particular talks about the fact that, um, and this is a fact that they bring up very regularly, that this referendum was not the voice of the people or the voice of the majority. It was 2.5 million voters out of a total population of 7.5 million um, 
so it, it, it is a huge, huge difference. It's not a majority. It's not even a majority like we had with Brexit. And of course, media is a big issue because one of the premises of direct rule, and this is where the socialists and the conservatives, the ruling conservatives part ways, is that the conservatives are talking about taking over the Catalan language media, uh, TV3, uh, Radio Catalunya. And uh, the, the media has become central to this battle. But, well, because is is the way the the transmission of the of the, obviously all the, all this information is going on. Also, internet could be affected. I mean, you don't know exactly what are the measures that the central government is going to take. But the 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 Catalan has always been in the in the middle of the discussions of the independence as a big piece of the culture. But definitely, the the follow the money rule uh, is really the, the the real basic explanation to all this. What's going on here? Well, the Catalans are not Kurds. Nobody was saying you can't speak your language. Nobody was saying you can't call yourself Catalans. Nobody was saying you can't fly your flag. Nobody was saying you couldn't even even make life very hard for Spanish speakers uh, in Catalonia. Nobody was saying that. All they were saying was your taxes were not all going to go back to Catalonia. That's what they were saying. And this has been blown up uh, into something really quite extraordinary. Quite extraordinary, and it's going to continue to unfold. We're going to look at some of the other stories we're following for you briefly. It was the week Emmanuel Macron said in the company of the visiting Egyptian president that France didn't want to lecture anyone on human rights. That comment eclipsed this Friday by what he said in French Guyana, France's poorest overseas department, where there were several hours of clashes with police overnight. Locals there fed up with crime, poverty, and a sense that Paris has forgotten them. Macron meeting the locals, uh, visiting the uh, European space station, posing for photo ops with indigenous peoples, and insisting that the French state is keeping its promise of 50 million euros a year of investment in schooling, health and policing. I'm not Santa Claus, because Guiana people are not children. I did not come here to make promises. That time is over. The state has made too many promises that have not been kept, so I'm here to tell things as I see them, make commitments that I can keep during my term in office, and help provide the authority, which is essential in this territory. I'm not Santa Claus, he says, when he, when he goes to, to, uh, to French Guyana. Is that political smarts or a blunder? Um, it always works for him. You must really admire this guy for saying to the pub, to, to sometimes really uh, violent demonstrators even, the truth, his truth. He, if he has a religion, President Macron he believes in the sacrosanct work. You work and then you get salary. So evidently he's not Santa Claus because he doesn't believe in gifts. And um, he has the power and the courage to say that. it was a little bit the discourse we heard uh, two presidents back under Nicolas Sarkozy. He would go and tell people, look, I'm not going to promise you this. He would sometimes have this sort of st yeah. straight, straight <clears throat> talk. Yeah, but did he face Marine Le Pen demonstrators in a parking lot and said, uh, yes, uh, I, we commit uh, crimes in Algeria? I don't think so. <laughs> no. No, I think that Macron is much more honest than Sarkozy ever was. And also, he seems to be a lot farther along in delivering what he has promised mm. than Sarkozy ever did. Um, but it, it, it does seem a kind of a doubtful thing to make those kinds of statements to people in Guyane who really are very poor. It is a forgotten part of France. I mean, there's a standard trick question. Well, it's not a trick question. What, uh, what is the longest land border that France has with any other country? And the answer is Brazil, because it's Guyane. But it's a it's very small population, a very poor population. You have this big space uh, installation, but all that money sort of stays inside. It doesn't get out to the people around. Uh, and he may not want to make promises that he can't keep, but he needs to give those people more hope than they've gotten. All right. It was also the week, by the way, where Venezuela's opposition was awarded the European Union's top human rights prize, the Sakharov Award given to those who for months have been rallying against acute shortages, hyperinflation and a tightening of grip on power by Nicolas Maduro's ruling leftists. But just when the prize was uh, being announced, the, that opposition seemed to start to come apart. The governor of Zulia dismissed for refusing to pledge allegiance to uh, Maduro's newly created constituent assembly. But four other governors breaking with the opposition and swearing their loyalty 
to a system that now, well, overrides the opposition-controlled uh, National Assembly. Uh, Sari Suarez, first of all, giving a prize to an opposition, what are your thoughts on that as a whole? Well, that's a peculiar uh, prize, effectively, because it's a mass that we don't really identify as a coalition of clear. groups, right, the opposition? Uh, they have prize. given prizes like to the Las Madres de Mayo in Argentina, and uh, which were groups, but those were clear groups. Here is something like very vague. But in another way, it's a way to show the support to an opposition that really have had a long, fi a long fight. And right now, they are very tired. Everybody's tired. The country is not believing anymore in the way that uh, the coalition of the opposition is dealing with the things. The last election left this opposition almost in zero because they, they, the feeling that the people have is that they have no plan and they are not flying this... Uh, Playing in the right way. So there is no faces, there is no leader right now, and, and it's an orphelin opposition. Um, it's orphaned. Orf, it's, orf, it's an orphan opposition right now. So it's a way to give, to give some hope to the people, to let them know we are there, we're gonna, we want to help you, um, but obviously the, the job has, has to be done by the Venezuelans. They need to rebuild some, some uh, political... Uh, uh, strategy, political support, political people that really can face a government that clearly is very well organized and they still have so all the power in their hands. An opposition that's orphaned, you're saying it needs a leader? It needs a leader. And and the question has been uh, posed for months, like who is the leader actually? Who's 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 really dealing with the, with the situation here? Because the president of, of the National Assembly that we have been seeing here in Europe and visiting some uh, some people trying to get support, um, is is now right now his uh, his position in Venezuela is very very weak, so we, we definitely need there is a need for a new leader. The the problem is that we don't see anybody really having the the tools to deal with the uh, with the situation of this government that now is a minority, but even when they are a, mi a minority, they are still very well organized and they have a structure in a political and social way that keeps them alive. You're going to be talking about the United States, huh? Well, we will talk about the United <laughs> States right now, in fact. Some are wondering if uh, uh, it's a turning point inside of Donald Trump's Republican Party. Two big-name senators uh, from the, the Republicans, under pressure from his populist wing, announcing that they're not seeking re-election and taking plenty of parting shots, both over Twitter and on the Senate floor. We must stop pretending that the de get degradation of our politics and the conduct of some in our executive branch are normal. They are not normal. Reckless, outrageous, and undignified behavior has become excused and countenanced as telling it like it is when it is actually just reckless, outrageous, and, dignif and undignified. And when such behavior emanates from the top of our government, it is something else. It is dangerous to a democracy. And now, of course, Trump uh, letting loose after remarks uh, like that. On Twitter, he said the reason uh, Bob Flake, who you just heard, uh, uh, Jeff Flake, who you just heard, and Bob Corker, Tennessee senator, dropped out of the race is very simple. They had zero chance of being elected now act so hurt and wounded. Does he have a point, the president there? Oh, yeah, he absolutely does. And for Trump, I mean, this is such a perfect thing in a way. He can look at them and say one of his favorite words, you're a loser, a loser. And that's exactly what he's saying about them. So it doesn't matter in his world. It doesn't matter if they're, they're exactly right about his presidency, and they are. Uh, he just dismisses them as losers. And, and, and a lot of the people who follow him will embrace that argument. And what did you think of the words Jeff Flake used on the Senate floor, his, his Mr. Smith goes to Washington moment there? Well, look, what he's saying is true. And all the people who hate Trump listen to that. And even they, if they didn't like Jeff Flake, they were like, whoa, that's great. Somebody's saying that on the Senate floor. But frankly, it's not so brave that he said it because he is a loser. The only person, the only person who really has been standing up and saying that kind of thing and is not a loser, is John McCain, the only person in the Republican Party. He's been up and saying it, and he's been saying it again and again in very, very clear terms. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's 
wonderful the decency that he's shown, including a tweet in, uh, endorsing and embracing Jeff Flake, who's also from Arizona, as he is. Um, but, uh, you know, it looks like he's not going to be with us for very much longer because he has what probably is terminal brain cancer. And, and the uh, fact that Jeff Flake had to drop out of his race, uh, he, he, there was a Republican challenger backed by uh, Trump's uh, uh, former advisor, Steve Bannon, uh, from the populist, some would say xenophobic uh, wing of the, of the Republican Party. Is this the victory of Steve Bannon? Uh, is this that no, that Flake wing was of on, the Flake uh, was on the rocks anyway? Uh, is that wing of the Republican Party though? Well, we'll see. The critical taking race, over the critical the GOP. race there. The critical race there is going to be in Louisiana, where a Bannonite who's a complete lunatic uh, and really a shameful character, uh, and so shameful that Trump was persuaded to campaign against him in the Republican primary. If he wins. And he may well, because it's a very Republican state, uh, when he goes up against the Democratic challenger, then uh, that will be a victory for Bannon, because he was Bannon's guy, not Trump's guy. If uh, he loses, if the Democrats should, by some miracle, win that election, it'll be a huge setback both for Bannon and for Trump. But we'll see. We, we, shall, we shall see indeed. Dove Alphon, this uh, right turn inside of the, uh, of the Republican Party, uh, People in Israel, because where politics have moved to the right over the years, yeah. are people happy with it? Well, um, it's certainly a problem for Netanyahu and his clique because they always said, we'll get better deals with the Republicans. We really, let's cut this uh, historical uh, ties with the Democratic Party. But if the guy is a lunatic and he says all kinds of strange things, including anti-Semite borderline in, inside the White House, it's really beginning to be a problem. And I, I think that we could say that the world this week is really a, in the center of the famous problem of the leadership vacuum, either in, in Catalonia and in Venezuela, where you were asking where, are, where, it's, where is the father of the revolution. It is a, a, a leadership vacuum Why? That, that Donald Trump represents because there's nobody in the Republican Party that steps up and, and says, OK, this is something, only two losers on the Senate floor. And, and nobody in the Democratic so. Party who can organize it to be an True. effective machine. Yeah, no opposition whatsoever. Why, do, why are we having leadership vacuum in uh, these, well, in these it's, times? Well, it's, it's, I, I think it's a symptom of all times. It's something very profound. And sometimes, like this week, like this exact hour, when in Catalonia we're having this crisis, we can see it blown up and we can see how dangerous it is for democracies. Sorry, Suarez? Yeah, it, and it, it is terrible because we keep, we keep voting in the elections for the less bad person. Right. It means that there is a, a lag, there is a hole here that we need to mm. fill in. We need more people prepared and really ready to get the control of the governments. We are still voting just by. Uh, it's, it's not a gambling game. It's really the the countries and and the and the populations that are in the middle of the of, of the of the line here. Emma James, on on Brexit, and the way it's been handled since, some are saying, well, uh, the best minds are just not going into politics anymore. <laughs> well, on no, both sides of the and, aisle. And I think it's not just about minds. It's about the best people because. Undoubtedly, there are exceptionally talented, intelligent people within the Conservative government that the UK has right now. Should they be leading the country? That's an entirely different question. If you look at somebody like Boris Johnson, there is no doubting the fact that he is incredibly smart. He's the, the best kind of smart. Donald Trump would love to be as clever as he is. But that doesn't make him a good leader. And, and it's very interesting to see how becoming unspoke, outspoken and saying the unthinkable is really appealing to so many people right now. It's almost as though it's the anti-politics because people are sick of the double talk, sick of the kind of mealy-mouthed comments, and they want someone to say something outrageous. Well, well, outrageous. That's because I think that we can say with some assurance that a lot of the people who support Trump don't vote, vote, didn't vote for him as a leader. They didn't, weren't looking for a leader. They were looking to be entertained. 
and they find him still very entertaining. A lot of people do. I have lots of acquaintances, like even friends in America, who will tell me, oh, well, you know, my t the stock market's going up, my taxes are going down, and he's very entertaining. So he may be a shameful spectacle to a lot of us, but what can you say? On the other point about not very good people running for office, there is a great line, it's the only line, that I remember from Plato's Republic, where the, he says, he who refuses to rule is liable to be ruled by one worse than himself, <laughs> which is clearly what we're seeing in Great Britain now. All right, we're going to leave it there for now. I want to thank you, Christopher Dickey, Sara Suarez, Emma James, Dove Alphon, and thank you for joining us here in the, in the world this week. Thank you.